Florence, Italy. For centuries, travelers have been coming here to gaze at the wonders of the Renaissance. 600 years ago, this city experienced a creative explosion unlike any other. Visionaries like Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo flourished here in an atmosphere that celebrated imagination and innovation. Many believe the Renaissance began with the completion of the city's most visible landmark, the dome on the Cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore. Built 60 years before Columbus sailed the Atlantic, without the use of modern machines or materials, the dome is still the largest of its kind in the world. It's an icon shrouded in mystery because no one knows exactly how it was constructed. Certain features of the dome stand out. It's in the shape of a pointed arch with eight sides rising to a central point, topped by an enormous marble lantern. But there is more to it than meets the eye. Exterior tiles conceal walls containing over four million bricks. And what appears to be a single solid structure is actually two domes, one inside the other. The interior dome covers an open space nearly half the length of a football field, while the outer shell rises 10 stories atop cathedral walls themselves 170 feet high. Questions about how the dome was built persist to this day. Six centuries ago, how could builders work at such great heights? How could they know the eight sides would meet in the center? And how did the steep brick walls hold together without collapsing? With the dome, Florence moves into an entirely different dimension. The dome becomes the hub of a new city, of a new world. So this is so soaring, so daring, so confident, so absolute a structure. It's like a work of God. But the dome is the work of a man. One of the most elusive and enigmatic geniuses of all time. His name was Filippo Brunelleschi. Trained as a goldsmith, he had no experience in architecture or building, yet he took on what seemed to be impossible, keeping 40,000 tons of masonry curving through the air without caving in to the floor below. Experts are still trying to understand how he managed to defy gravity. He constructs the dome at a time where the technology should not have permitted it. How is it possible that he built the thing when he did? It just should not have been possible. By all accounts, Filippo Brunelleschi was a suspicious and secretive man. Unlike Leonardo, he left behind no notebooks, no drawings, no blueprints for later generations to study. So for centuries, scholars have been trying to uncover the secret of Brunelleschi's dome. Brunelleschi is so revered in Florence, they hold a parade every year on the anniversary of his death. The destination his tomb within the great cathedral itself. Leading the ceremony is Massimo Ricci, professor of architecture and engineering at the University of Florence. Ricci has spent 40 years of his life trying to understand the master's methods. For Ricci, Brunelleschi has become an obsession.
lo studio della cupola. The study of the dome is so difficult and so daunting because it forces you to deal with the mind that created it. It's a direct relationship with the way of thinking that existed outside the norm. And that engagement inspires a kind of fear, but at the same time a great respect for him that is beyond measure. Smisurata stima della persona di lui. The mystery of the dome has taken such a hold on him that for nearly 25 years Ricci's been building a dome of his own in a park in a residential neighborhood in Florence, employing what he believes to be Brunelleschi's methods. He began construction in 1989. Since then, the model has served as an open-air laboratory, with Ricci playing the role of Brunelleschi and crews of architecture students putting his ideas into effect. Ricci insists his approach is the only way to answer questions that have mystified scholars since the Renaissance. I was the only one who felt the need to build a model on such a grand scale to understand more deeply all the secrets hidden within the dome. Problematiche della cupola. Now, Ricci's experiment is at a crucial point in the process. With over 400 tons of masonry in place, the walls are beginning to bend inward. The pull of gravity is unrelenting, and the danger of collapse is very real. Soon it could be too risky for students to continue the work. Per capire la cupola, to understand the dome, you have to go through the problems of the bricklayers. Whoever doesn't do this is going to make a big fool of themselves. Delle grandi brutte figure. Cenzo, te dai spostati un po' qua. Basta. In the Renaissance, there were no lasers, computer animated models, or detailed blueprints to guide the process. Builders relied on ropes to control the progress of the work. Ricci is convinced that the secret to the dome has something to do with the special way Brunelleschi used rope lines to establish how each brick should fit into place. Ricci's dome is one-fifth the size of Brunelleschi's, but still huge. Large enough, he hopes, to prove his theory of the secret of the dome correct. I think oftentimes when you have an artist whose personality remains as vague as Brunelleschi's, uh, inevitably what scholars do is to almost assume the role of the artist. What you're trying to do is to put yourself into the mind of the architect. Trying to find the secret of the dome is trying to find the secret of Brunelleschi. The search for that secret begins in the years just before the Renaissance. At the dawn of the 14th century, a kind of medieval arms race is raging between Florence and other emerging city-states, like Siena and Pisa, each trying to outdo the other by building bigger and bigger cathedrals. Florentines uh, are very creative people. They're also very competitive people. That means, among other things, they want to do what no one else has done. And they decided that other cities in Tuscany, other cities in Italy, had grander temples than they did. And so they wanted to compete with them, and more especially, they wanted to outdo them. In 1293, the city leaders of Florence form a committee to oversee the construction of a new cathedral. They want theirs to be different from any other. Florentines dislike the look of the Gothic cathedrals that have been spreading across Europe for over a hundred years. They consider them too cluttered, with their walls propped up by flying buttresses and their many tall, pointed spires. For inspiration, the committee looks to ancient Rome, 
in particular to the classical temple honoring all Roman gods, the Pantheon. It was famed for its unrivaled dome made of poured concrete. But such engineering technology had been completely erased by centuries of war. And it's the accepted wisdom of the time that no culture will ever rival the Romans in the building arts. Florence is determined to surpass the Cathedral Committee's vision for Santa Maria del Fiore keeps expanding, longer, wider, higher. Eventually, the Committee's reach begins to exceed its grasp. They were really presenting themselves with a serious problem because in enlarging the church, what they're also enlarging is the crossing area of the church, right? essentially where the two arms would intersect. Like many cathedrals, Santa Maria del Fiore is in the shape of a cross. The larger the church, the larger the area over the altar place needed to be covered by the dome. They eventually create a cross in space which measured 143 feet 6 inches across. Today, in the 21st century, it would be difficult for us to cover, to roof such a vast space. In the 14th and 15th centuries, theoretically, it should have been impossible. A mural depicting the cathedral years before the dome was begun shows what the committee had in mind. An enormous pointed dome with eight sides meeting at the top. There's no question it's going to be spectacular. There's just one catch. No one knows how they're going to build it. What was so challenging about building a dome on this cathedral? After all, a dome is nothing more than an arch rotated 360 degrees. And by 1300, Gothic cathedrals had been using arches and vaulting for over a hundred years. How did they do it? Medieval technology relies on wooden frameworks to hold the masonry until the final piece is put in place. The two sides pushing against each other allowed the structure to stand on its own. This method is known as centering. In the Middle Ages, if we're building a vault, if we build that wooden framework, we put our blocks, our bricks on top of it, we wait for the masonry to dry, then we make the sign of the cross, pull the wooden framework away and run like hell, because the failure rate on most of the, these vaults was about 50%. But this technology would not work in the Florence Cathedral. The problem with the wooden centering for Santa Maria del Fiore was that it was going to be unprecedented in scale if they built it. It would have been enormously expensive. The area beneath the dome is so high and so wide, just building the wooden framework to support the masonry would have taken hundreds of trees, years of construction, and huge amounts of money. Unless someone someday invents a way to keep curving walls in place as they rise, the dome will never be built. <laughs> 